Today on the show, we break down Dylan Cousins and Peyton Krebs. You're Locked On Sabres, your daily podcast on the Buffalo Sabres. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Sabres your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today on the show, more exit interviews. This time, we're going down the middle at center. Uh, Dylan Cousins and Peyton Krebs are up next on the show. If you missed our previous episodes going through Jack Quinn, J.J. Paterka, Casey Middlestat, Alex Tuck, Jeff Skinner, and Tage Thompson, check it out on the feed wherever you're listening or watching right now. Uh, very interesting episode last time with Jack Quinn and J.J. Paterka. Interesting reaction, I should say, to the episode. I got a lot of agreement with me, which is always good, that, uh, that Jack Quinn is the breakout candidate for the Sabres in 2023-24. The biggest step up for any player, I think, uh, is going to be that guy, uh, number 22. So we'll talk more about him as the offseason progresses, but uh, we'll get some playoff talk today. we got Cousins, and we got uh, Peyton Krebs as well. And if you look at different um, comments that were made about us, uh, Jason asked us, does it make you wonder if another year in Rochester would have been good for Paterka? Weissback, Rusek, Byro would have all been interesting to see in Buffalo. I do not hold that opinion. I think Paterka did just fine with the Sabres this year. I know I referenced that 29-game stretch in the middle of the season where he only had one goal and three assists, uh, but he worked through those inconsistencies. He got hot again at the end of the year. He showed that he could be a power play contributor. He showed that he could play on a line with Dylan Cousins and Jack Quinn at times. And I think him working through those inconsistencies, learning next to Alex Tuck and Kyle Poso uh, in the locker room, I think he's got to go through that at some point. So why not do it right away? Uh, I think that there's more development for him to be had at the NHL level than there was at the AHL level. He had already conquered the AHL level. He had already become a point-of-game player there. He had already led the Amherst to the playoffs. I, I think it was time for him to be in the NHL. So I think the way the Sabres have handled development, I think, has been perfect. They have not rushed guys in under Kevin Adams and Don Granato, but by no means have they made guys wait. If you're ready, if your next step is NHL, we're not going to let you wait, and we're not going to let you spend a minute too much uh, of time in the uh, in the AHL, which is why I'm very confident Matthew Savoy is going to be in the NHL this season. Um, but anyways. Thanks for the comment, Jason. If you want to get involved with the show, Twitter or on YouTube, uh, be sure to give us a question or a comment. Before we get to our exit interviews of today, uh, some playoff talk at the beginning. I got a couple of takeaways from the last couple of nights in the postseason, especially with some potential suspensions that we're going to see in the Edmonton-Vegas series. Um by the way, if you were watching that game, how about Evander Kane and Jack Eichel nearly coming to blows uh, and fighting? Those two were close when they were here and have always seemingly had a good relationship post-career, um, post their time in Buffalo. But playoffs, man, they got it tangled up in front of the net, and I thought they were going to go. Um, that might not have worked out well for Jack. So the big, the big thing to talk about, though, coming from that game is Alex Petrangelo and the just outrageous – slash that he had on Leon Dreisaitl. The game was out of hand. The game was under a minute to go or just about a minute to go. Um, and it's a two-handed, over-the-top slash on Dreisaitl's wrist. The puck is long gone, seconds gone. He is not engaged with the play anymore. Shea Theodore, who was actually the defenseman that was covering Dreisaitl, not Petrangelo, had let up seconds before because he knew the play was off dry Zettel's stick and it was going around to the other boards. Um, and Theodore gives up. Petrangelo makes has intent to come over to where dry Zettel is, stick over the top, comes down on his wrist. He is lucky that Leon dry Zettel's wrist did not break on that play. And you know what? It's one of those where the NHL, they are so result driven when it comes to suspensions that, if Dreisaitl's wrist had been broken, Petrangelo would probably be out for the rest of the playoffs. But because he was fine, and luckily he was fine, 
I don't know how uh, severe a suspension Petrangelo is going to get. By the time you hear this show, there's a chance that we will have news on whether or not he gets suspended or what he gets. NHL player safety is going to have a hearing for Dreisaitl uh, on Thursday afternoon. So I think he should get suspended. Connor McDavid said thought he should be suspended, and the way he put it I thought was perfect. McDavid, McDavid said, you'd like to see it reviewed for sure. I would like to see it suspended. I mean, it's as intent to injure as you can get. Time, score, clock, all play a factor. Here, here it comes from over the head and, you know, places it just under Dries, uh, Dreisaitl's chin. Uh, the intent is the point here. And I think because the intent was clearly to injure Leon Dreisaitl, Alex Petrangelo, in my opinion, if I were running the Department of Player Safety, would be suspended for the rest of the series. Because that was his intent. His intent was to take Dreisaitl out of the series. The, no doubt. That's what he was going for. And because that's what he was going for, I think that's what he should be suspended for. Rest of the series for Alex Petrangelo. I do not believe, though, he will get that. Uh, unless the series ends in two games, which I guess it could. Um, and he gets two games. Other playoff talk, there's the Panthers in the Leafs series. A lot of violence at the end of that game, by the way. Toronto survives. Their first win in the second round in 20 years. And it was a good game by them. Marner played well. Uh, Nylander gets the other goal. He got lucky. He went off a ref. Um I, I think the Leafs are still doomed. Jason Wall was good in that game. He only played seven games during the regular season. I'm not confident he's going to hold up throughout the rest of the series. Maybe Sam Sonoff gets back, but I think the Panthers will take care of business in game five. Uh, all right. And then one other around the NHL thing that I got to get to here. The Philadelphia Flyers. God love the Philadelphia Flyers. Got to love them. They are just oh, so great. They just don't know what they're doing. They went from Chuck Fletcher and John Tortorella to hiring Danny Briere as interim GM. And I thought, oh, okay, eh, interesting. Not just because I love Briere from his time with the Sabres, but young, maybe a different type of philosophy, a different type of thinking, a guy who hasn't had the job yet. You're going for a, a new mind. And all right, let's see what this is. Then we find out they're probably going to keep John Tortorella. Don't love that. That might come from the top more than it even comes from Briere. And then... We get news that the Flyers are going to hire a president of hockey operations. Okay, let's see who this is. Then we find out it's Keith Jones. NBC Sports, now TNT, TV analyst Keith Jones is going to be the president of hockey operations above Danny Briere for the Philadelphia Flyers, who has never held a management role in the National Hockey League has made no effort to hold a management role in the NHL. In fact, Briere made his way up, <clears throat> excuse me, made his way up the ranks. Briere was working his way up as the co-general manager uh, of the, uh, the Mar I think it was the Maine Mariners, um, an ECHL team. He ran an ECHL team, built them up, got some work in at the AHL level, assistant GM with the Philadelphia Flyers under Chuck Fletcher. He went through the steps that were necessary to get himself ready to be the GM of this team. Keith Jones didn't do any of that. Keith Jones was just on TV and never said anything interesting for, for, for 18 years. Has he ever broke down play in a way where you thought, oh yeah, this guy knows hockey. I mean, he used to play hockey. We know he knows hockey, but he's never said anything that makes you think he thinks the game on another level. So I, I just, I do not get it, but I love it from a Sabre perspective. I love that Keith Jones is now running the Philadelphia Flyers. Um, and God help Dan Danny Briere. Pray for Danny Briere as he is now sandwiched between Keith Jones and John Tortorella. Good luck with that. And he's got Rasmus just in on the books for the next uh, four years or whatever on a really bad contract. So Flyers are, uh, in my opinion, doomed. But they did make a nice move on Thursday and uh, making their orange a little brighter. They went from like a burnt orange to like a brighter, almost almost neon orange. So I like that from the Flyers' perspective. Time out here. When we come back, a Dylan Cousins exit interview. We're going to go through the, his season. What's to come with Dylan Cousins? Um, one of the breakout players of the season for the Buffalo Sabres. That's up next here on the Locked on Sabres podcast. And as always, we are presented by Indeed. 
Indeed, there's no I in team, but there is one in Indeed, and that's the hiring platform that you need to build yours. When you're hiring, you need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's powerful hiring platforms can help you do it all. We They streamline hiring with powerful tools that find you match candidates with instant match. Over 80% of employers get quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description. The moment they sponsor a job, according to Indeed data in the U.S. Even better, Indeed's the only job site where you can where you only have to pay for applications that meet your must-have requirements. Indeed is an unbelievably powerful hiring platform delivering four times more hires than any other job site combined that according to Talent Nest uh, in 2019. Join more than 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Start hiring now with a $75 job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash locked on. Offer is good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash locked on. Indeed.com slash locked on. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Sneaky Joe DiBiase back here on the Locked On Sabres podcast. Thanks for making us your first listen every day. Now we go to our exit interview series today. Dylan Cousins and Peyton Krabs, and we will begin with Dylan Cousins. A huge year. For Dylan Cousins, a breakout year for Dylan Cousins, almost on the level that Tage Thompson went through last year. In fact, just about he did. In his second season, age 20, 2021-2022, Cousins, 13 goals, 38 points. Skyrockets up in 22-23. 81 games played, 31 goals, 68 points. And he did that playing between two rookies in Jack Quinn and J.J. Paterka, who were his most common line mates at 5-on-5. Five five. Now, one thing important to note about Cousins, that while those were his most common line mates at 5-on-5, five five, he played on different lines more often than anybody else. Um, and I think part of the reason for that was Don Granado did not want to play Paterka and Quinn at the end of games, especially close games. And... He was not going to take Dylan Cousins out of the rotation. So he would throw Cousins up with a different line. He would he would put him with middle stat or he'd give him a shift up with tuck and he would kind of split things up. If you look at at five on five, his most common line mates by ice time, it's very evenly distributed. Um, time spent at five on five with JJ Paterka, 600 over 600 minutes. That's a lot. Jack Quinn over 400 minutes. But right below that, you've got. Vinny Hinostroza at 156. You got Casey Middlestad at 126. You got Tuck at 113. You got Olison at 110. That's a lot of guys over 100 minutes of ice time for the year. Jordan Greenway at the end of the year, 64 minutes. Thompson, 63 minutes. Skinner, 58. Now, those guys at the end, that kind of happens to everybody. That you'll play 50 to 60 minutes with everybody. But all those guys that he played over 100 minutes with. Um, again, I know Paterka and Quinn are the large sum here. But Cousins did play with a lot of guys. But mostly Quinn and Paterka. And when you're playing with two rookies like that that are inconsistent, your numbers are going to be down a little bit because of that. So what's interesting is Cousins was a 68-point player. There's more in there. There's more production in there, at least. Because what I see happening in the future is as Quinn gets more consistent, as Paterka gets more consistent, Cousins' production is only going to go up because those guys only scored 27 goals on the year. What are they going to score combined next year? 50? 40 at least it's probably gonna it could double and that's a bunch of assists that are going to be available to Dylan Cousins that were not on the table for him last season so I think 70 plus points is right to expect from Dylan Cousins next season that is an uptick from where he was at least by a little bit uh in 22 23 but what Cousins in in all in all really proved is that he is a franchise number two centerman Thompson grew into that number one center role Cousins showed you I can be this team's number two center. And that is huge. The Sabres have number one and number two center locked up for the next seven years. That is enormous for this team. It is one of the hardest things to find. It's what they were searching for before they tanked, when they had Derek Roy and Tim Connolly down the middle and it wasn't cutting it. It's what they had in Briere and Drury and haven't had since. Thompson and Cousins could be, I think, a one-two punch on a great Stanley Cup contending team. Uh, but they need, of course, you know, everything to kind of get fully formed around them. 
Now, a couple things about Cousins' game. Some misconceptions about his game and some things that stand out. One, he is an elite transition player. An elite transition player. Uh, Dylan Cousins, as a transition player, one of the best in hockey in terms of his ability as a, as a zone entry man, as a zone exit man, neutral zone. I mean, he is the guy you want carrying the puck through the neutral zone more than anybody else. Um, an incredible transition player. What... One misconception I want to throw out there about Cousins. He has this rep at the moment of being like a future Selkie guy. one An elite shutdown defenseman, a two-way centerman. And at the moment, it's not true. I, this is not to say Cousins cannot become that player. And maybe, you know, part of it is that he played with Paterka and Quinn, two rookies. Again, could be a factor here. But Cousins was actually bad defensively. In this season, in some areas. Now, uh, one site, one analytics site that breaks these things down by percentile, Andy and Rono uh, is the uh, AR hockey stats on Twitter. They break down these things by percentages um, for the entire league. And what they have Dylan Cousins at, his overall defensive impact, they have him in the 14th percentile among forwards. The 14th percentile. Now, some things he was great at, some things he was bad at. One, denials stopping opposing forwards from entering the zone. He was in the 77th percentile. So he was very strong there. But recoveries, loose puck, you might think win the battle, right? Like go get the puck um, and, and get it out yourself. He was in the 5th percentile. He was actually horrible at it. Now, one other thing he was really bad at, penalty kill. Horrific penalty killer. 2nd percentile for the penalty kill. But... One thing that might excuse some of that poor play, other than the rookie uh, line mate part of it, is his roll difficulty. 85th percentile on roll difficulty. He had very challenging matchups. So he's got to grow a lot when it comes to those numbers. Um, but it's definitely a reputation that he carries, and it's not yet earned. I think him being from a small town in Canada, I mean, as small as it gets, right, with Whitehorse, um, He's a hard worker, the workhorse from Whitehorse, right? When you have a nickname like that, you're going to get the reputation of being a great two-way centerman. But there's only one way working at the moment. And he's got to really grow into that that second part of it, that, that defensive game. I think he will, personally. I think him being the workhorse from Whitehorse, like he works on his game. He's still young himself, the line mate part of it. I think he will grow as a defensive player um, in a big way. But just know that it hasn't happened yet. In, in terms of the numbers. Now, if you want some other numbers from that site, Andy and Rono, on how great he is offensively, overall offense, he's in the 89th percentile for the entire league. And overall transition transition game, he's in the 95th percentile. Uh, he's an incredible offensive player already. It's just a defensive game that he's got to work on. Now, one other thing about Dylan Cousins. He's been talked about as a future captain. Uh, Paul Hamilton, WGR, or my coworker, WGR, he, he's thrown that idea out there in the past. Um, I don't know if I hear him say it as much anymore. I think Cousins is going to be a part of this leadership group. I personally think Darlene will be the captain. I wouldn't want to rule out Cousins, but I think at the very least he'll be a guy that wears an A in the future. Um, but that's the overall gist with Dylan Cousins. We don't have anything contract-wise to talk about. He's on an incredible contract uh, that's going to be with him for the next seven years just over $7 million. Um, that's going to look like a great contract in the future. It's 7.1 million. He is signed through 2030. So we got a long time with Dylan Cousins as a Buffalo Sabre. All right. Time out here. When we come back, Peyton Krebs, a little bit more of a challenging player to break down uh, his 22-23 season. So we'll get to that coming up here on the Locked On Sabres podcast. And before we do that, we want to remind you, to if you're looking for tickets, if you want to go to a game nearby, if you want to go to a concert, you got to check out Game Time. Buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all your sports, music, comedy, and theater need, needs near you. With killer deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun that you'll have. Game Time is the place for last minute ticket deals. Forget planning months in advance. Game Time is deals and tickets right up to the day of the event. The Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. It is the fastest growing ticketing app in the country. 
for a reason. Get images of your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. That's my favorite part. The angles of your seats, you know exactly what you're going to see. Buy tickets in a matter of seconds. Two taps and you're set. Tickets are sent directly to your phone so you never have to dig through your email. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account. Use the code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account. Redeem the code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last-minute tickets. Lowest price guaranteed. Final segment. Sneaky Joe DiBiase here on the Locked On Savers podcast. Thanks for making us your first listen. Exit interviews. We went through Dylan Cousins. Let's go through... Peyton Krebs game in the future uh, as it pertains to Peyton Krebs. Now, Krebs season, a little harder to break down. And that's because you can't just look at the numbers and figure out what his season was like. He played a very different role than I was expecting. Now, Krebs numbers on the year, nine goals, 17 assists, 26 points. If I read those, those point numbers to you before the year, you probably would have thought, ooh, Krebs didn't take a step forward, didn't play well. Maybe we're on his case after this year. But what I will have to say about that is it's wrong. You can't break down Krebs' game just looking at the numbers. And that's surprising to me. I thought this was going to be a player where his numbers would be the thing we talk about. That his playmaking, especially a guy that I think I've said in the past, I could see him being a 60-point player where he gets 15 goals and 45 assists. Um... And I still think that's in there, but that's not what he was asked to do this season. He really was asked to be a defensive specialist. And in part, it was because there are so many young guys on the team. Somebody had to pick up that role. Somebody had to do it. And Krebs, he was the man up for it. His most common line mates on the season in a runaway were Zemgis, Gergensen, and Kyle Lekposo were his most common line mates. So... That's very telling, right? Like, he was playing with the two checking veteran guys uh, that played hard matchups, played big minutes. Uh, Krebs getting some penalty kill time as well. I think he was arguably the Sabres' best defensive centerman. Uh, I know Cousins, again, as I referenced in the last segment, has that reputation, and it's not yet earned. I think that's Krebs. I think Krebs their best, best defensive center at this moment in time. Now, his expected goals for number represents that. He, in terms of the growth, He went from a 38% expected goals for a guy at 5-on-5 last season to 45% this year. That's a massive jump uh, in terms of the the 5-on-5 numbers. Um, Of course, fans love him. Teammates love him. It's not just the defense. He became their fighter, which is pretty amazing for a guy that's only 5 feet 10 and is one of the smaller players on the team up front. Uh, Krebs had a couple of fights on the year. Connor Clifton against Boston, remember earlier, where he actually was cut after the fight, and he's doing the, the yeah, let's go, like firing up the boys on the bench. Um, he talked about it after the, after the season, how much he loves sticking up for his teammates. He's not afraid to drop the gloves. Um, I don't really see value in that in terms of on the ice, but it makes him more well-liked, and it makes him more well-liked in the locker room. So I guess there's at least some value in that. Um, my question about Krebs, is there a future for him that goes beyond where he played last season. Can he be more than just a fourth line center? Now, in terms of ice time, you know, he was more of a third liner, but the fourth line role is what he did. The checking line, the defensive line, the two-way game. Is there more for him than that? Because the Sabres did not trade him to be that. If he's going to be that and provide value that way, that's fine. But I do think he's more capable. I really was waiting. There were injuries all year, and middle stat was the guy that they put up on the top line. He did great, of course. But... I remember saying before Middlestat went up on that top line when Tage Thompson was was getting injured, I wanted to see Krebs on it. I wanted to see Krebs between Jeff Skinner and Alex Tuck. He really is the one guy that all year never really got a shot in a top two line. He never got a chance at it. And that's unfortunate because I think he could do well in that role. Um, but again, Middlestat's kind of the next man up when there's an injury in the top six. So I'd like to see him on a more offensive line in the future. But it's hard for me to see that happening with all of their forwards they have and all the forwards that they have on the way. So maybe this is it for Krebs. Maybe he's their defensive specialist going forward. Like, who are his most common line mates next season? I'd love to sit here and tell you. I'd love him to play with the top six, but who's coming out? I mean, you could put him in Paterka's spot, but then you're taking him away from the center position. Um, 
You're not taking Cousins out. You're not taking Thompson out, of course. You're not taking Middlestat out of the third line. So, I like Greenway and Jost. Jordan Greenway, Tyson Jost on like a defensive specialist line. Like maybe that's the future for him. He'll play with Jurgensen's or if Poso, if one of them return. Maybe he's got a future with Yuri Kulik. And those two can turn into uh, two way players that can also score. That 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 feels like a good fit for me in the future. Kulik's best attribute right now seems to be his shot, but. Even though he hasn't been this way in Rochester, when he was drafted, we heard about his two-way game. So if Kuli could turn into a two-way player that can score goals and put the puck in the back of the net, that might fit well with Krebs, who is a two-way player and is a playmaker. Um, so I like those two in the future, but I'm not sure that'll happen as soon as uh, as next season. So Peyton Krebs, that's the, the game breakdown. The contract, he's got one more year on his on his entry-level contract at uh, an 863 uh, eight hundred sixty-three thousand dollars in terms of a cap hit, and then he'll be a restricted free agent. I think probably a modest contract's in line for him, unless he takes a big offensive jump, which could happen. Um, I'd like to see forty points at least from Peyton Krebs next season. I think there's potential for him to get fifty plus, depending on his role. Um, but to get a bigger contract, he'll have to get fifty plus points. I think what's more likely, he ends up thirty to forty-five ish points, and he signs a three-year bridge deal with the Sabers because I don't see him to be one of those guys that's in line for a big, massive seven-year extension. Peyton Krebs, I would give. I've been doing grades here. I would give a. I would give a B plus to Peyton Krebs. I don't want to give him an A because there wasn't the offensive growth that you would hope for, um, despite the fact that that wasn't completely within his control. Cousins. I want to give an A minus huge step forward offensively, not the step you were hoping for defensively, but offensively on this team, in my opinion, more important. So a minus for, uh, for Dylan cousins. All right. That's it for us today here on the lockdown savers podcast. So thanks everybody for tuning in coming up next for you. Everydayers on our show, we are going to get to Jordan Greenway and Victor Olofsson. They are the next two forwards on our exit interview series that we'll get to. So come back for that. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in and uh, we'll talk Greenway and Olofsson next time here on the lockdown savers podcast.